Good morning. Um, in the spirit of using all of our time, I think we should get started. So welcome to the uh, first OSHA Grand Rounds of 2020. And 2020 sounds like such a futuristic science fiction kind of era. And uh, it's, it's scary to think we're there. But I think today um, we're actually going to be seeing a presentation that that makes me think that we are living in the future, and this is the future of medicine and the future of science. Uh, I'm so delighted today to be able to introduce our speaker, Dr. Michael Levin. I'm going to call him Mike, if that's okay, um, who's a professor um, and the Venevar Vin Bush Endowed Chair um, in the Department of Biology at Tufts Medical, uh, at Tufts University. He's also the director of the Allen Discovery Center at Tufts and the director of Tufts Center for Regen Regenerative and Developmental Biology. In addition, he's a visiting scholar at the Wyss Institute at Harvard. Um, Mike received his bachelor's degree in computer science and biology from Tufts and then got a PhD in genetics from Harvard, and he stayed there for a while where he started the, um, his laboratory for research at the Forsyth Institute. During his career, uh, Mike's received a, a number of uh, very prestigious honors and awards. He's been awarded the Junior Investigator Award from the Society for Physical Regulation and Biology and Medicine, the Distinguished Scholar Award from Tufts University, the Scientist of Vision Award from the International Functional Electrical Stimulation Society, and the Established Investigator Award from the American Heart Association, all in his short, um, remarkable career. Um, a main focus of Mike's uh, laboratory has been uh, understanding the molecular mechanisms necessary for morphogenesis and uncovering and exploiting uh, the cooperative signaling dynamics that enable complex bodies to build and remodel themselves in a correct structure. One set of these signals um, that has been of particular interest to researchers who bridge both conventional and alternative medicine research are bioelectric signals. Mike's talk today will focus on endogenous bioelectrical networks and regeneration. And while his talk is not aimed to explicitly bridge conventional and integrative medicine, um, he's agreed to address some questions that might emerge at the end. So towards that end, I've also invited my friend and colleague, Andrew Ahn, to uh, help shape the discussion. And Andrew's particularly qualified at building that bridge. In addition to being a physician uh, and hospitalist here at Beth Israel, um, he's the co-director of the Dynamical Biomarkers in Medicine Laboratory and also has a PhD in biophysics um, and is an acupuncturist. Um, so without further ado, um, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Mike Levin. Well, thank you very much for having me here to speak to you. Um, uh, as, as he said, I run the Allen Discovery Center. You can find lots more information on our website. And uh, I want to prepare you uh, in, in just two ways for what we're going to talk about. Number one is that uh, my, my talk is going to be uh, featuring entirely data from non-humans. Okay, so I'm not a clinician. I'm a basic uh, biologist and computer scientist. So you're going to see a lot of worms and frogs and things like this. But the reality is that all of the mechanisms that we deal with are incredibly ancient and highly conserved. So all of the things, and, and in fact, I will show a little bit of data from um, human mesenchymal stem cells and things like this. But all of the mechanisms that we deal with were discovered back in the days of bacteria, and they exist across the tree of life, including humans. So this is not meant to be you know, sort of frog and worm specific stuff. I think all of this has implications for human health. Um, the second thing is that uh, you know, I was told to, to talk about energy medicine, and, and I do think this is an example of energy medicine, but not because I'm going to talk about bioelectricity. That's not the energy part. So we do not apply any electromagnetic fields. We do not deal with um, any sort of unusual energies, nothing like that. The reason I think this is an example of energy medicine, you're going to see it um, hopefully in a few minutes, is because what we are working on are strategies to manipulate biological systems in terms of information. So not rewiring the hardware, not manipulating uh, the specific uh, 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 pathways that exist uh, in the organism, so gene editing, uh, the, these kinds of things, but actually providing uh, inputs and motivating the system to do something that it would not otherwise do. And I think this is really fundamental in uh, what I understand to be energy medicine, but it's not because of the bioelectric component. I think that this, this, uh, this idea of how you manipulate complex systems for, uh, for health is actually much more important than the fact that we, we, we deal with um, electrical signaling. So uh, <clears throat> the main points of today's talk are basically that 
uh, what we really need to do in order to uh, make good on the promises of regenerative medicine is to understand decision making by cells and tissues. So trying to motivate these living agents by inputs instead of hardware rewiring. I'll show you what I mean in a minute. Uh, a key medium of this uh, in the living state is non-neural bioelectricity. It's uh, a pathway that works together with all the familiar chemical signals, physical forces, and so on, that actually is how uh, uh, living, uh, complex living systems implement the kind of software that controls their uh, structure and function. And that what, what we work on is this idea of cracking this bioelectric code, and we think that by understanding the way that cells and tissues <coughs> use electricity to uh, merge themselves into higher functional units will actually make for some really interesting applications in uh, birth defects, uh, traumatic injury, cancer immunology, and even synthetic biology. So uh, boil down to one slide, everything I'm going to tell you today basically is, is this, that like the brain, somatic tissue networks uh, process information and they make decisions about anatomy and that we can now target the system for control of really large scale uh, anatomical properties. Um, uh, just as an example, you're gonna see some weird looking creatures. This is uh, one of our five-legged five frogs. This is not Photoshop. These are real live animals uh, living in our, in our lab. And the reason uh, we have these is because this is how we test our understanding of what's going on. In other words, if we think we understand how uh, the body structure is determined, we should be able to make alterations in those signals and have coordinated rational control over anatomy. And this is what I'm going to show you. So our center works on a number of fundamental questions. Uh, you can see them here. One of the key ones is this connection between the genome and the anatomy. So we all know that the genomic information is very important, but actually where the uh, structural information for the three-dimensional layout of the body comes from is not at all a, a trivial or a solved question. And so we're interested in understanding this. We're interested in targeting the communication process among cells that allows them to cooperate towards large-scale anatomical goals. And actually, uh, we use a very um, uh, integrated approach to this, having, uh, having, having taken a lot of important uh, concepts from things like uh, computer science, artificial intelligence, and so on. So what I'm going to do today is to uh, address some knowledge gaps. Okay, I think it's very important to point out what we don't know and then talk about bioelectricity outside of the nervous system, and then uh, speculate a little bit what I think is, is happening in the future. Okay, so knowledge gaps. So this, this here is a single cell. This, this is called the lacrimaria. Now you see that this amazing, so what he's doing is he's going around and eating the, the bacteria in his, in his environment. This, this creature handles its physiology, its shape, its anatomy, its real-time control over its anatomical uh, uh, layout, and its, uh, its behavior all in one cell. There's no brain, there's no nervous system. All of this is happening in, in one cell. And so what this shows us right away is that individual single cells are highly competent, okay? Uh, which leaves us with an important puzzle in looking at a, a, a large scale body such as, such as uh, we have, you have to ask the question, what would motivate individual cells like this to work together and, uh, and cooperate towards building a much larger structure. I mean, this guy's focused on handling all of the things that sort of go on right around his surface, a very small uh, sort of self. But, but then during multicellularity, they have to add up, and, and, and some of them will end up as skin cells, and they'll sit quietly on the surface of an organism to be shed at some point during a life uh, span of the, of the organism. But, but somehow they have to work together. So how does this happen? How do these things... Uh, scale the, the, the boundary of the self to, to, to make much larger units that work together towards specific ends. And what I mean by that is the fact that we all start life as a single cell, but when this fertilized egg starts to divide, these uh, progeny cells have to self-assemble. They have to self-assemble towards a very specific, very complex three-dimensional end goal. And a lot of people think about stem cells. Differentiation into cell types is not sufficient because what you see here uh, is a tumor. This is a teratoma. This thing will have muscle. It will have uh, uh, hair, skin, uh, pieces of teeth. It'll have all, the, all these various tissues where the differentiation process has gone correctly. But what makes this different from that is that the three-dimensional structure is missing. So simply getting uh, stem cell derivatives is not sufficient. You need to have information that assembles you into a very uh, complex morphology. And so in fact, this is a cross-section, of course, of a normal human torso. Just l look at the remarkable um, invariant arrangement of all the tissues relative to each other. Where is that information? You know, and of course, you look at the, that the genome, you can't directly read out any of this from the genome. Yeah? So uh, we have to ask, how does the information uh, that exists in these individual cells 
lead to their cooperation to build something complex as this. And then as, as, uh, in, as, as um, in medicine, we would like to know if, if a part of this is missing, how do we get these cells to rebuild what they once built? And then as engineers, actually, we ask a further question, which is, well, can we get it to build something different? Can we use these cells and convince them to build something completely different? So one of the um, kind of stories that a lot of people learn in developmental biology uh, is this sort of open loop process where you've got some gene regulatory networks. Some of these genes make proteins that do things. In, they interact as a kind of physics. They're sticky. You have adhesion proteins. They generate physical forces, whatever. And then there's this process of emergence, which basically means that if we have a lot of this stuff going on in parallel, somehow in the end, you're going to get something like this. You're going to get a complex morphology, okay? And, and for sure, this, all of this does occur, but it's only part of the story. And the reason it's only part of the story um, is that embryogenesis is reliable, but it is not hardwired. And for example, if you take an early embryo and you cut it in half, you don't get two half embryos, you get two perfectly normal monozygotic twins. We, by the way, you know, we work with a lot of roboticists, and this is, this is the envy of, of all of them, because we don't have any machines that do this. You can't cut any of our artifacts in half and have two, two normal ones. You can do the opposite. You can take two um, uh, mouse embryos, you can mush them together like a snowball, and you get a perfectly normal mouse out the other end. So this is interesting. These things are able to uh, sort of uh, make up for pretty radical deformations that are happening and, and, and get to the same uh, fi you know, the same final goal at the end of it. Um, but this is not only for embryos. So this is regeneration. Uh, in a salamander, this thing is, a, is, a, is an axolotl. It's a Mexican salamander. This guy regenerates its limbs, its jaws, its eyes, its ovaries, its spinal cord, and portions of the brain and the heart. So uh, here's an example. Um, this is a natural experiment that they do all the time in an aquarium. They bite each other's legs off constantly. When uh, the leg is missing, they will quite rapidly regenerate a uh, um, a, a proper limb, and it's indistinguishable from the original. And the most amazing thing about this, if you think about it, lots of people are working on kickstarting regeneration in, in human patients, of course, but the most amazing thing is not the fact that it starts. The most amazing thing that, is that it knows when to stop. So think about that. You know, a, a, a pathway for cranking up uh, cell division uh, when you've been injured, that's not, you can sort of imagine how that would work, not terribly hard. <clears throat> but how does it know when it's done? So it's got to have some ability to, uh, to have a stored um, um, uh, a set point as far as what a, a normal salamander limb looks like and to stop when it gets there. And I'll show you some more examples. This, this turns out to be really critical. I'll show you some examples of this. This is another uh, creature I want to introduce you to. This is a planarian flatworm. These are not like earthworms. These are our ancestors. They, uh, are, uh, they have a true bilateral symmetry. They have a true brain, most of the same neurotransmitters that you and I have. These are uh, advanced organisms. They can be cut into pieces, in fact, into any pieces. There is, no, uh, there is no slice that won't lead to regeneration. Every piece of this knows exactly what to do to make a complete worm. The record is 275 pieces or so uh, to, to date. And the most amazing thing is that, so you cut it in half right here, right? This back portion will grow a new tail. This front portion will grow a new head. These cells were direct neighbors. They were sitting right next to each other until you separated them, and yet they have a completely different anatomical fate. So they have to, the cells at the wound can't tell what to do simply by virtue of their position. They have to talk to the rest of the tissue to know what they should be making, and this becomes important. By the way, these guys are, are immortal. There's no such thing as an old planarian. They have solved the aging problem. So if, if, if you've read these thermodynamic theories of aging that, you know, with time errors accumulate and we all have to die, wrong. So these, these things are, uh, are, are basically, the individual cells do senesce and, and die. The animal as a whole is immortal because it just regenerates anything that's lost. So we have worms in our lab that's basically, that, that are uh, in direct physical continuity with worms that were here half a billion years ago. These, these are literally them. They, they have solved that problem. So <clears throat> you could imagine that if we really understood regeneration, aging is one of the things that might get solved as, as a result of that. So um, regeneration is not just for these kinds of uh, lucky uh, model systems. Of course, the human liver is pretty regenerative. Uh, and this, is, uh, this has always bugged me as to how the ancient Greeks knew that the, the liver was the one organ that was going to grow back, kind of interesting. Uh, deer, every, uh, every year they regrow large amounts of, uh, of antler. Antler is, is, is bone vasculature innervation. This thing grows up to a centimeter and a half per day. Think about that, a centimeter and a half of new bone <coughs> growth per day. Okay? So this is a large adult mammal that will do this, and, if, and human children uh, below a certain age will actually regenerate their fingertips. 
This is a painting of uh, Prometheus uh, being chained up on the, on the mountain, and uh, every day this, um, this eagle comes and he, and he eats his liver, and the liver regenerates. Right? So we can sort of think about how, how what, what kind of, you know, back then when, when you know, pretty much any kind of wound would have meant sepsis and death, like how would they, anybody have known that the liver would actually regenerate? I have no idea. It's kind of interesting, but that's the one organ that actually does. So uh, what's interesting about this, this ability to regenerate is that it's not just for things that are missing, it really is a kind of uh, a way to get to a particular correct uh, body anatomy. So, so this is an old experiment where you could take a tail and you could graft it to the side of the salamander and where the limb should be, and over some period of time, that tail will actually remodel into a limb. So the tail tip cells will turn into fingers and so on. So this is a, these are plastic si systems that continuously uh, try to get from wherever they are to whatever the correct state is supposed to be. And that, I think, is a, <clears throat> is a, key, uh, is a key target for medicine going forward. This is something that we discovered a while, a while back, which is an interesting uh, example of this. Here are tadpoles, and here's what a frog looks like. So every tadpole is supposed to become a frog. In order to do that, uh, they have to rearrange their face. So the eyes have to move forward, the nostrils have to move, all these different things have to move. It's a very active process. And, and before, it was thought that this was kind of a hardwired process, that you know, every tadpole looks the same, every frog looks the same. If you, if you know what movements all the cells are supposed to make, you, you'll get from, from the beginning to the end. So what we did is we made these, and I'll show you in a minute how we make them. We made these Picasso, what we call these Picasso tadpoles. Everything's in the wrong place. The eyes are back here, the jaws are up here, the placket, you know, every, everything is just, everything's just all over the place. And the amazing thing is that these guys generally make pretty normal frogs. So what happens is all the different organs that start off in the wrong position don't just move a certain amount like they would have in the normal and end up in the, in the wrong place. They actually keep moving until the whole thing rearranges itself into more or less a normal frog. So what the genetics here specifies is not a set of movements, uh, a set of hardwired specific movements for the different organs. What it specifies is a flexible uh, system that can keep moving things around until they get to a correct configuration. Okay. And so to this basic scheme, then, we need to add a, f a couple of feedback loops, both onto the, in the genetics but also in the physics, and this is the portion I'm going to tell you about, where any kind of an injury, and by the way, injuries are not just traumatic uh, things like this. Injury could be uh, teratogens, it could be mutation, it could be um, aging, it could be cancer, it's a lots of different things that are threatening the anatomical integrity of, of the structure that will then feed back and, and activate various uh, components of this morphogenetic process to try to reduce the error between what's going on now and what it's supposed to be. Now, this is, this is very much a non-standard view of how these things work, but it makes some interesting predictions. Uh, one of the predictions, this, this is basically, you can, you can think of this as pattern homeostasis. So very familiar, I'm sure, is homeostatic cycles for, things, for, for physiological parameters, right? Temperature, pH, all these kinds of things. This is pattern homeostasis. This is a process that seeks to keep the body within a particular kind of anatomical pattern. If this process exists, it suggests that uh, rather than intervening up here, trying to manipulate at the lowest level all this, uh, the, the, the processes that are going to uh, percolate eventually up to here, which is what most of modern molecular medicine tries to do, is, is, is to intervene at this level. What we could do instead is to target the set point. So if you, think about, if you think about this process, any kind of a homeostatic process has to have a set point. It has to have some way of knowing what the correct anatomy is. And then you know, a, a, an error minimization scheme. You can, the simplest version is your thermostat. You have a way of setting what you want the temperature to be. And then it continuously takes measurements and then readjusts based on whatever's going on now relative to what the set point is. So if this is true, it suggests that somewhere there is uh, at least a rough uh, encoding of what the set point is supposed to be. And maybe instead of manipulating the cells down here, what we could do is target the, target the set point. Maybe we could alter what it is that the cells are trying to build, not touch the cells at all, let them do what they do, which is build to the, build to the set point, <clears throat> but manipulate the information structure that controls this, this feedback step. So this is what we've been doing. Um, and so, so what I've told you so far is that patterning is incredibly plastic. And the key to this is that they repair towards specific anatomical states. And this means that we need to understand not only the molecular pathways that are necessary for this to happen, okay, uh, and, but we also need to understand the information processing that enables them to do this. And the future goal, if we sort of ask, okay, uh, when you know, in my group we think about how do we know when we can all go home? You know, what's the what's the end um, you know the end goal of all of this stuff? The end goal for us is something, and we're nowhere near this, by the way. So, so you know, we're not uh, nobody's in danger of uh, losing their uh, their jobs here, um, in the sense that 
Uh, the end goal is something we call an anatomical compiler. What you should be able to sit down the way that you would for a 3D printing or for CAD or for anything like that and draw out the animal that you want. Draw it at the level of anatomy. Not, not specify the molecular pathways, but actually draw the animal that you want, uh, des define where all the different major components are, and this thing should, if we knew what we were doing, should be able to uh, compile down into a set of specific signals that you would need to give the cells to give you, and this is actually a real three-headed three -headed worm that we made, uh, it should be able to give you what you need. And so when the, 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 um, uh, the end game for all this is to have a, a sufficient understanding of cellular cooperation towards specific end goals so that we can literally write the end goals that we want and get the cells to build whatever it is that we need. If you think about it, once th this will basically handle most of the problems of medicine. With the exception of, let's say, infectious disease, if you could have proper control over anatomy, you could induce uh, growth and regeneration of any organs that you wanted, birth defects, you could reprogram tumors into normal tissue, you would uh, be able to reverse aging and degenerative disease. Most of the problems of biomedicine come down to the inability to control large-scale um, uh, uh, tissue and organ structure at will. And this is, this is where I think this has gone. So there are some very basic, now, now uh, of course, uh, molecular biology and developmental biology has made uh, tremendous strides uh, in, the last, uh, in the last decades. We know a lot of things, but I want to point out some, some deep uh, uh, areas of, of ignorance, things that we don't know. So most of us, uh, most, most animals that, that you know about, when we have a, uh, when we, when we um, encounter a mutation in our lifetime, so let's say in the middle of your arm there's some cell that gets mutated, your children do not inherit that mutation, right? So this is a process known as Weissman's barrier. It keeps, uh, it keeps all of the things that happen to you during your lifespan from uh, percolating down into the next generation. Planaria aren't like that. Planaria reproduce largely by fission and regeneration. So a, so a given worm will tear itself in half, Okay, each half regenerates, now you got two worms. That's how they reproduce. But think about what that means. That means that in the body of the worm, any mutation that doesn't kill the stem cell that it hits is going to propagate into the next generation. Right? And so, because, because as, it, as it tears in half, it has to rebuild the next half, and whatever cells it's got, those are the cells that are rebuilding. So planaria accumulate all their mutations, unlike us. So for 400 million years, these guys have been accumulating every mutation that doesn't kill uh, the cell in fact, their genomes are an incredible mess. Um, there isn't a good assembly for these guys because it's not even clear what you're sequencing when you try to sequence the genome. They're mixoploid. Every cell has a different number of chromosomes for this reason. I mean, it's just an incredible mess. So the genome is a mess. They've, they're, they're, they've been accumulating these mutations, but their anatomy is rock solid. They are champions of regeneration. Every piece of a planarian, without fail, will regenerate a perfect worm. What is that telling us about our understanding of the relationship between the genome and the anatomy when you can basically trash the genome over these years and the anatomy is, com is, is, is completely solid? So we have lots of questions uh, to, to think about as far as the origin of body plans, where this information comes from, and so on. So we're getting uh, much better at the mechanisms of developmental biology and genetics. We still really don't understand the algorithms, the decision making that leads to specific anatomies under different conditions. So the reason that this matters is, is this is critical for regenerative medicine. What we're good at is putting together things like this, you know, um, basically gene regulatory networks, pathways, you know, which genes affect which other genes, and that's great. But what we really want to understand is things like this. And, and there's an important, there's a lot of work to do uh, in, in the middle here. In fact, for most of these things, if you, and I do this with my students um, all the time, if you take a, a, a paper that has these things in it and you sort of put your hand over the title and you ask them, you say, well, what, what is this? Is this a, like, what shape does this make? Is it, a, is it a snake, an octopus, is it a tree? Well, what's this gonna do? It's almost always really difficult to tell, okay? So um, when, and this has practical implications when you wanna repair a particular complex structure, but what we have are a set of relationships like this what do we manipulate down here to get the shape that we want? That's a really hard question. And so now here we get to, the, to kind of my main point of, of the, whole, the, the whole business. This is what programming, so, so let's just think about um, uh, computer science and what, what enabled computer science to drive this amazing progress in information technology. This is what programming looked like in the 40s. Okay? 
what she's doing is she's physically rewiring the thing in order to get it to do something different. You have to, back then, you had to move wires around. You literally had to change the physical structure of the system in order to get it to do something, to do something different. The reason that we now have all this amazing technology is because computer science figured out early on that actually what you can do is uh, abstract from the physical structure of the device, and if the device is good enough, it meets some very basic computational criteria, you can leave the hardware alone you don't have to rewire it. You can use progressively higher level uh, languages to talk about the flow of energy and thus information through the system and guide it into different modes of behavior by inputs. So when you want to switch from Microsoft Word to Photoshop, you don't get out your soldering iron and start re re rewiring your laptop. You have this amazing uh, thing called a keyboard where you provide experiences for the device. You provide inputs. And these inputs are transient. You, pr you, you, you press a key. You don't keep it down for the rest of the time that you're using it. So the idea is that what they figured out was that if the hardware is good enough, you can actually radically reprogram its function without having to uh, uh, get in and uh, control its, its underlying physical structure. What I'm going to claim is that biological hardware is definitely good enough, and I'll show you examples of how we do this. So uh, can, we, can we move beyond the machine code? I mean, basically most of what is really exciting uh, today about uh, molecular um, biomedicine is increasingly specific uh, molecule level approaches. People are very excited about genome editing and uh, single molecule pathways and things like this. And those are all very important, but they are all operating at the hardware level. Think about what uh, uh, information technology would be like if we all had to operate computers at the level of the circuit. Right? It would be a real, a real uh, uh, problem. So I think we need to move beyond this to understand actually what, and, uh, what's going on here and control it in a different way. So, um, so what I'll do now is, is show you our attempt to, uh, to, to, to do some of these things. All of the cells in the body are sitting embedded in a field of information. Okay? And, I, and I point out right from the start, because I'm going to spend the next half hour talking about bioelectricity, bioelectricity is not the only game in town. There are lots of components to this morphogenetic field. There are, of course, chemical gradients. There are physical forces, so biomechanics. There are oxygen gradients, pressure, you know, tensions, all these different things. But bioelectricity is a particularly interesting one, I think. And every cell in the body is sitting in this field of information that's coming at it from all of the other cells in vivo. And this field of information is important during embryonic development, during uh, normal remodeling, during uh, the attempt to keep yourself, uh, keep the body together against aging and cancer and in some cases during regeneration. This is, these are all physical uh, bearers of information that cells need to have in order to know what to do in a larger context. So in the brain, um, it's kind of a pretty known story what bioelectricity does. Uh, you have these specialized kind of cells uh, called neurons. They have ion channels. They build up a voltage potential across their membrane, and they communicate that to their neighbors through various kinds of synapses. And this hardware uh, is, is amazing, and it underlies some very interesting software. The software here, what you're seeing is uh, in real time in a living zebrafish brain, all the electrical activity as the fish is thinking about whatever it is that zebrafish think about, you can see this happening in real time. So there's this idea of neural decoding. The idea is that if we understood these electrical dynamics, we could tell what the information structure of, the, of, of this, uh, of this, of this uh, mind is. And in particular, people are working really hard to take human and animal uh, brain scans and try to tell what they're thinking at that time. And it's a reasonable um, uh, scientific uh, process, uh, goal because we believe that these information structures are in fact being implemented by these electric circuits. And if we understood this, uh, the, the semantics of the electric circuits, we would know what this meant. So turns out that, and actually, I mean, it sounds pretty surprising, but if you think about it, it's, it couldn't have been any other way. Neurons didn't just appear out of nowhere. Neurons speed optimized uh, things that cells were doing long before. Okay, so there's, there's really almost nothing new that neurons are doing. All cells have ion channels. All, uh, all cells have these electrical uh, gap junctions, these electrical synapses to their neighbors. M many cell types have uh, ancient neurotransmitters. All of this stuff was around in our unicellular ancestor. It's been here long before, uh, long before neurons actually showed up. And in fact, if you start to look at outside the nervous system, so this is, uh, this is an, early, uh, an early movie. Uh, of voltage signaling uh, made by my colleague Danny Adams, uh, basically very similar to what you see in the brain. This is an early frog embryo trying to put itself together. And the different colors are a voltage-sensitive fluorescent dye that shows you where all the electrical activity is. 
and you can see all the cells talking to each other in these electrical patterns as the cells are trying to uh, sort out who's going to be head, who's going to be tail, ventral, dorsal, and so on. And so the idea is to be able to crack this code, much like neuroscientists are trying to crack this code. For the bioelectricity that I'm talking about, um, you have, to, you have to think a little bit differently in two ways. Number one, this has nothing to do with electromagnetic fields. So this is not at all about uh, applied external radiation. It's not, there's no magnetic component to this. This is, this is really just endogenous electrical signaling. And it's not rapid spiking the way it happens in the nervous system. It's much slower than that. And so think more like this. This is a nice example of, uh, of bioelectricity. And all cells generate and receive these kind of basic electrical signals. So as I said, we can, we, can now, uh, we can now visualize these things with these voltage-sensitive fluorescent dyes. So you can, you can see what the cells are saying to each other. We do a lot of uh, quantitative simulation to try to say, okay, well, here are the different channel and pump proteins that the cells have. How do those add up to different voltages? So there's a lot of computer simulation. And these things are, uh, first of all, uh, endogenous pre-patterns. So you can see here, actually, this video is not playing. So you can see here that uh, this, is, this is one frame taken from this movie. This is a frog embryo. This is time lapse. Uh, this is a frog embryo putting its face together. And you can see all the uh, different electrical pre-patterns. But here is one snapshot of a changing pre-pattern. This is the layout of the face. This is a subtle scaffold that tells you where the genes are going to be expressed to, uh, to, to create the frog face. Here's where the eye genes are going to go. Here's where the mouth is going to go. Here are where those, the, the lateral placodes are going to go. And we know that these things are absolutely instructive because if you de depolarize uh, out here and, so, and sort of hyperpolarize this region and wipe it out, then the eye will be wherever it is that you put that depolarized region. This is how we made those Picasso tadpoles that I told you about at the beginning. This pattern is what sets the expression of BMPs, frizzles, all these other genes. And you can rearrange this using either optogenetics or other uh, mechanisms I'll talk about in a minute and really have uh, amazing control over the uh, resulting anatomy. So this is a normal, uh, a, a cre a normal bioelectric pre-pattern that is required for normal patterning. This is a pathological pre-pattern. What we've done is uh, injected some cells here with a human oncogene, and they make a tumor, and the tumor then will spread. This, uh, in this tadpole, the, these, these cells are detected early on using this voltage dye. They have an aberrant bioelectrical signature. One of the first things that cells do when they get hit with this, with this oncogene is they strongly depolarize, which we catch here, and then they close their electrical connections to their neighbors. This is part of what causes cells to depart from the uh, working towards the anatomical body plane and to go off on their own as, as cancer-transformed cells that basically revert to their unicellular ancient past. But you can see this, and the applications for diagnostics are, are pretty obvious. You can see this in the living state when this happens before you actually anatomically can see that there's going to be a tumor. So these patterns are necessary and, su and sufficient for particular kinds of uh, uh, morphogenetic behavior. So what we've developed are tools to, to manipulate these things because it's nice to watch the patterns, but more importantly, you need to alter them and you need to uh, uh, respecify them to see if they mean anything. So in any non-neural network, uh, we have ways to do this, both uh, genetic and pharmacological. We can open and close various channels. We can introduce new channels. We can open and close these gap junctions. We have pretty good control now over uh, the way that cells pass electrical signals to each other. Again, remember, we do not apply electric fields. There are no electrodes. It's, those are very dull, um, blunt tools that uh, have been used in the past. We now have uh, molecular physiology where we can use, let's say, optogenetics to put down light uh, masks that will turn specific channels on and off. So our goal is to understand what is the meaning of these signals by, by altering them. I'm going to show you some examples of what you can do when, when, when you do this. So one thing you can do is we, we, we saw that, uh, that eye-inducing uh, pattern. We can put that voltage, uh, that same pattern of voltage somewhere else. And so here we've put it on the gut of this tadpole, and sure enough, it makes an eye. Uh, the traditional master eye gene for eye development is, uh, is PAC6. PAC6 does not induce eyes anywhere outside of this region. This you can put anywhere you want. You can put these eyes on the tail and the gut. It kind of doesn't matter. What you do is you re-specify the electrical pattern for what you want the cells to build, and they will build. The important thing when we do this is that, no, note the modularity. We do not specify all the information that's needed to make an eye. It, it's, it's very complex. It has, it has dozens of cell types. 
But what will happen is when you, when you specify a fairly simple trigger that says build an eye here, the cells go and do what they know how to do, which is to make an eye structure. And it ends up with the same, you know, it's got the retina, lens, um, optic nerve, it's got all the, all the stuff it needs. Um, you can do something in planaria where here is a normal worm, you cut off the head and the tail, this middle fragment has this voltage gradient that tells the polarity of which way here's the tail, here's the head. And so you can go ahead and, and, and reprogram this at the, at the electrical uh, level and say, I want this to be depolarized like the head. And sure enough, that cells at the blastemo will make a head. And now you get these two-headed animals. Um, or you can make no, no headed animals. They're, they're viable both. Again, modular, because we don't know how to make a planarian head. What we do know how to do now is how to uh, say, uh, electrically, how to say build a head right here. And the cells happily do that. Notice that it's correctly scaled to the rest of the body. It's functional and so on. Uh, these things are not only uh, structural; they're also they're also functional. So, if you were to make it, uh, if you were to put an eye on the tail of this of this tadpole, uh, we found out that these eyes can see perfectly well. They um, the optic nerve that comes out connects up here in the spinal cord. This machine tests their vision. Notice they don't have any primary eyes here, and they can see uh, quite well out of this eye. And they can do vision. They can do vision learning and things like this. The plasticity of of, of the system is 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 quite quite amazing. So. What I just showed you a minute ago is that we can radically change the anatomy of, uh, of the planarian and ask it to build a head uh, on, on the other end. Now, those heads that we built had very normal morphology. They had the normal head shape appropriate to that species. Can we, uh, can, we, can we change that? So what we found out is that you can, and in this species, you can see it's got a nice triangular head shape with the little, little uh, oracles out here. You cut off the head, and then you perturb that electrical network. What you can do is you can get it to make flat heads or round heads, or normal heads. But the amazing thing is that these heads are actually the same shape as other living species of planaria, 150 million years distant. And in fact, not only the, the, the head shapes change, but actually, I don't know if you can see this, but the shape of the brain and the distribution of stem cells in the head becomes exactly like these other species. So on the fly, you can shift the morphology of these heads from the normal genomic default to the head shapes and structures of other species and again, much like with the two-headed animal, the, the genomes are wild type. There is no genomic editing here, okay? There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with their genetics. These are physiological um, stimuli that are, that are pushing the system into a, towards a different uh, anatomical goal state. And so, in fact, you can go further and you can make uh, really wild uh, types of shapes, this kind of um, uh, spiky thing. This, if you can see, this is sort of like a, like a, like a ski hat kind of a thing with a, with a hole in the middle. They, Flatworms don't even have to be flat. They can start growing into the third dimension. There are regions of this morphous space that you can reach by manipulating this, this um, process of, of, of cellular decision making that are not currently used by evolution. I mean, these, these of course, are. These, to my knowledge, are, are not. They're probably not um, competitive in the wild. But the idea is that normal cells with normal uh, species-specific genomes are actually quite happy to build completely different things if they can be motivated to do so. And so what we've been doing is uh, trying to crack this, uh, trying to crack this. And what I propose is a slightly different view. Right now, what people often say is that the DNA is the software, and then the cell is um, is, is the hardware. I actually think that's that's uh, there's a, there's another way to, to to look at it, which is that the DNA is what specifies the hardware. Okay, every cell's genome tells you what kind of ion channels, but also adhesion proteins and various other things. But let's stick with the bioelectrics. What the DNA nails down what kind of ion channels you get to have. But this is a really important lesson from, um, uh, from, from, from engineering, which is that, which is that uh, if for, for specific kinds of electrical systems, once you nail down the electrical components, that doesn't automatically determine what the information content is. So what you see here is what's called a flip-flop, which is a basic, a very small kind of circuit that can contain one of two stable electrical states. It's a basic memory. And depending on whether you transiently uh, put, a, put a potential here or there, you can keep information flowing in this way, or you can keep information flowing the other way. And it will contain a zero or a one, meaning this pattern or that pattern, without having to move any of the stuff around. There's some interesting uh, analogies between this and living tissue. First of all, if you were to take an x-ray of this and figure out where all the components are, where all of the, so the, the proteins are, so to speak, you would still not know what the information content here was. Okay? You can't recover that from the dead state. Bioelectricity is exactly the same. All of the um, electrical processes that I told you about disappear as soon as the cell dies. 
none of, this is one reason why this stuff is, it lags, uh, has lagged so far behind biochemistry and molecular biology. You can't, you can't fix it in, in formaldehyde and you know, study it later. It all goes away. You have to be looking at the living state. Uh, and, and that information is, is only recoverable at the living state. The other important thing is that knowing what ion channels are here, so proteomic profiling, transcriptomic profiling, is insufficient to know the physiological state because you don't actually know whether these channels are open and clo or closed and what the electrical activity is. So uh, the DNA locks down the hardware, but now once every cell has this sort of, um, uh, 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 this, this, this hardware, these multicellular sheets are actually able to drive uh, a, a kind of um, a really dynamic uh, change in the, uh, let me see if this, That movie's not playing either. So uh, what what you would have seen up here is, uh, is 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 a is a is a is a computational model showing that even when all of the channels are identical in every single cell, they can actually self-organize various patterns, much like you can get in in electric circuits. So uh, so the hardware does not, in fact, uh, the specification of the hardware does not nail down the software. So this makes a prediction. We should be able to rewrite this while keeping this intact. And I've already sort of shown you that in the, in the worm. I'm going to show you an even, uh, an even better example. So basically, what we can, what we can show is that here, here's a normal worm. So this is a one-headed planarian. It's got a head and a tail. And uh, the head is expressing head marker, head genes. The tail is not expressing head genes. Here's another one like that. You cut this guy, you get a one-headed worm. You cut this guy, you get a two-headed worm. So now, wh why in the world would you get two distinct anatomical outcomes from the same, from the same kind of body, and they, have, they both have the wild-type geno genomic sequence? It's because in the meantime, what we've done is we, uh, we've rewritten the electrical pattern that tells this, this thing how many heads a planarian should have. So here's what a normal pattern looks like. That says build one head on one side. Now, this is pretty messy. Uh, but what we've done is we've been able to say, okay, there's actually two, two heads should go here. But, and, then, and then if you cut it, this thing will actually make two heads. But notice something really important. This pattern right here is not a readout of what the anatomy is now because this is still a one-headed worm. This is a, a, basically a pattern memory of what to do if you get injured in the future. This is, this is really critical because if I showed you that this thing had two... Uh, depolarizations at either end, which it does, you'd say, well, yeah, that's obvious. The head is, is depolarized, so what you're seeing is basically a readout of the anatomy. That's not what this is. This is a pattern that exists in a one-headed animal, which, it, which says, uh, what should we do if we, re if we are called upon to regenerate? If you're not called upon to regenerate, you stay like this, and there's no problem. The electrical state here does not match the current uh, anatomical layout. It is a latent memory of what is going to happen if there is an injury in the future. So a single body is able to store at least, no doubt there are more. We've, we've been able to nail down two of them, but it, I'm sure there's more. A single body is able to, to maintain multiple, uh, multiple uh, set points. Go, let's go back to this, this idea at the beginning that there's an, there's an information structure that determines what are, what are we going to do if, if we need to um, reassert morphogenesis. There are at least two possible ones that you can keep and both of these can, can be kept in the same, uh, in the same kind of one-headed body, but they have radically different outcomes if there's an injury. Okay. So uh, now, here, now, now I, just a minute ago, I called this thing a memory, and why, why would I call it a memory? So here's, a, here's an important uh, a component to this, which is that if we make this two-headed worm, and usually, usually people ask me this uh, at about this time, if I have this two-headed worm, I cut off the primary head, I cut off this uh, ectopic secondary head. I keep a nice normal middle fragment. It's genomically normal. What hap I put it in plain water. What happens to it? So you would think that surely you'd get a normal worm because you got rid of this, this crazy ectopic tissue. The, ge the genetics are still normal. Of course, this thing is going to make a single-headed worm. And the reason I'm showing you this is because that's not at all what happens. When you cut this thing, you, this middle fragment will continue to remake two-headed animals in perpetuity. It is permanently stable. So. Once we make this two-headed worm, we have permanently altered the idea that this uh, tissue has about how many heads a, a normal planarian should have. And it will stay true to this idea and continue to rebuilding to that set point. That set point is encoded bioelectrically. The genome of this guy is exactly the same as of this guy. 
because planaria of fission and regenerate, you can imagine throwing this in the Charles River, and 100 years from now, some scientists will come along, they'll pick up some two-headed worms and some one-headed worms, they'll say, ah, cool, a speciation event, let's sequence the genome and see where the, you know, where the change is, and of course, that's not where it is, that is not where you're going to find it. So, the reason I call it a memory is because it's long-term stable, permanent as far as we can tell, uh, it is rewritable. We can take a single-headed worm and rewrite it to two heads. We can take a two-headed worm, rewrite it back to one heads. It has latency or conditional recall. I showed you a minute ago. You can have a one-headed worm with a pattern that indicates two heads. It's like a latent memory. It only becomes called upon, recalled when you injure the thing. And there are discrete possible outcomes, okay? So, uh, I'm running low on time, so I'm going to skip this, other than to say that we are now uh, building, of course, models of the electric circuits that have these interesting properties. They have multiple attractors. Mostly, uh, they live in this one one-headed attractor. You can, you can uh, by, by judicious manipulation, you can knock the system into one of these other two-head or one-head um, attractors. So we have uh, a way to, to try to understand this. One of the important things is that this information is not local. These electrical circuits are making a decision on large, they're, they're distributed, they're not, it's not a single cell thing. And you can see it right away, this is a, a, a froglet. Uh, if we cut off a leg here, you have some bioelectrical stuff that uh, is important for leg regeneration, I'll show you that in a minute. But the really cool thing is that the uncut leg that you never touched lights up at exactly the same uh, position, proximal distal position. In fact, you can tell by looking at this, you can tell what happened to the other leg, what kind of damage it was, and where on the leg it was. So injury information is available throughout the body. This raises some, again, uh, some, some obvious uh, implications for maybe surrogate site monitoring and, and diagnostics, things like this. Um, and it's, uh, it's also, uh, so, so, so it, it's also a factor in pathological conditions. One of the things we can do is turn normal um, normal pigment cells or melanocytes into, uh, into melanoma. And when you do this, this is, this is, these are the melanocytes going crazy out here. These are the cells down here that we manipulated uh, purely electrically. There's no oncogene here. But you can see it's not the same cell. It happens at a distance. These, guy, these guys, when they get depolarized, uh, really uh, uh, push the normal, um, genetically normal melanocytes to, um, to convert. And actually, you can, you can use this to our, we can use this to our advantage and we can take uh, embryos that are injected with human oncogenes that let's say a quarter of them will end up having tumors, we can knock this down quite a bit by manipulating uh, the bioelectrics of cells on the opposite side of the animal. Again, it is not a local effect, much like in the brain, these electrical networks are spatially distributed, the decision making propagates. So you do not have to, in order to, uh, to, to control tumorogenesis on this side, you can actually be manipulating uh, bioelectrics on this side if you understand how the signal propagates and we're now uh, uh, making these these uh, models. So I want to show you two very quick, uh, very quick applications. This is what I just said. You can take perfectly normal melanocytes. They look like this, and only by transiently uh, suppressing their their ability to communicate electrically, you can see what happens. They they change their shape drastically. They start to gain vade. They drop into the neural tube, and you know the blood vessels here. I mean, it's basically metastatic melanoma. Um, we can we can we can cure this using a similar type of approach. Here's a human oncogene, here's the tumor that it makes. You can, you can misexpress an ion channel, the oncogene is still here, pretty strongly expressed, but there's no tumor. Because even though the oncogene is there, if you can force the cells to electrically keep connected to their neighbors and keep receiving those signals about what they should be doing in a larger structure, they, and, uh, they, they, will, they will not make a tumor, they will contribute to normal tissue. Uh, this is an example of birth defect repair, so here's a normal frog brain, so here's forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. And what you can do is you can, you can hit these embryos with either uh, teratogens, so we're talking nicotine, alcohol, things that cause pretty nasty brain defects, or uh, mutations in important neurogenesis genes. So let's say notch. You know, notch is a critical neurogenesis gene. When you introduce a dominant notch mutation, look what happens. Yeah, the, the forebrain is basically gone. The midbrain and hindbrain are a big bubble. It's just a complete mess. They have no behavior. They just you know, sort of lay there. What we can do is on top of this, uh, on top of any of these interventions, we can introduce uh, uh, a particular ion channel that we have calculated using our model will reinforce the normal brain pre-pattern. I had shown you a, a facial pre-pattern before. There's a similar uh, pre-pattern that controls the position of the brain. If you force that pattern, then despite the fact that all of these things have happened, you can get quite normal 
uh, animals, and they're normal not only in their brain uh, structure, but also in their IQ. So their learning rate goes back to normal. So you can really um, uh, repair or, or rescue this kind of, uh, this kind of situation. It, 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 it's fairly remarkable that you can, you can rescue from a, um, uh, from, from a dominant mutation in a key neurogenesis gene. So this is, this is uh, hope for us in, in, in biomedical approaches that by appropriate uh, uh, interventions in the, in the electrophysiological decision making, you can actually make up for some defects that might even be uh, at, the, at the basic um, genetic level. So, so um, in the last uh, minute or so, I just want to tell you where, where I think this is going. We've done a lot of this now in, uh, with David Kaplan's group in human, uh, human cells, cardiomyocytes, and so on. Uh, most of these things seem the same, although in, in culture with, with human cells, you don't see the same kind of exciting morphologies that you would get in, in, in vivo, but all the pathways seem to be quite similar. Um, what we now have is this idea of putting together uh, a, a tool, a computational platform, to help, uh, help people pick electroceutical cocktails for their own uh, for their own specific applications. So basically by using existing ion channel expression data, so let's say you're interested in some particular tissue, you know, let's say a ki kidney or something, you can look it up, find out what channels are expressed. Those are your potential targets to be open and closed. You have uh, an understanding of what bioelectric state is needed to make a particular organ. We have a simulator that uh, is able to uh, show you what would happen if you turn each of these channels on and off. And then by running through this, you basically, the system generates basically uh, a, a suggested combination of, of cocktails, uh, of drugs in a, in, a, in a cocktail, which you can then, uh, you can then find off the shelf. Something like 20% of all drugs are ion channel drugs. Many of these things are already in human use. So people take them for epilepsy, for cardiac arrhythmias, and so on. So the path, I think the path to application will be, uh, will, be fairly, uh, will, will be fairly easy for some of these things once this is complete and once we understand what channels do you want to open and close for any particular application? And it's not trivial because uh, these electric circuits are complex and the outcomes, the patterning outcomes of shutting these things on and off are not, you can't just sort of estimate them in your head. There has to be some serious um, computational modeling. So uh, in the end, what I've told you is that there's uh, this physiological software layer that sits between the genotype and the anatomy and that targeting this is really, uh, is really uh, important. And I think evolution discovered very early on that bioelectric signaling is a really convenient uh, medium for computation and memory. Bacterial biofilms already do some of this. So it's, it's, uh, it, it, was, it was here from, from, the, from the dawn of life, uh, this, this, this idea that you can use electrical circuits for making complex integrated decisions. I think that cracking this bioelectric code is really going to help us uh, understand how to rewrite these pattern memories and convince cells to build things that we don't know how to build from scratch. Uh, and this, this idea of uh, this biological compiler is something that we're working on with new machine learning tools that are coming on, online. And actually, I don't have time to talk about it, but this, this links a lot to our work on basal cognition and really looking at how non-neural cells store memories, make decisions, and so on. There's kind of a smooth continuum between this stuff that goes on in the body and the subsequent development of, of cognitive processes in uh, the first primitive brains and then complex brains. So uh, I would like to thank the, uh, the people who have uh, contributed to the work that I showed you today. These are the various uh, people in our lab and, of course, uh, the funders, especially the, uh, the Paul Allen Frontiers Group, which funds our center. And uh, if you wanted to know what uh, two-headed planaria look like, um, these are them. And so these are the true, remember, the, the important part of this is not simply the existence of two-headed worms, but the fact that they continue to form two pieces of these things, continue to form two-headed worms after amputation. Um, and uh, that's it. I thank you, and I'll take questions. Well, uh, thank you, Mike. That was just an amazing talk. I was just blown away. There's so much that um, there's so much that we're we're simply not taught in in medical school or in in basic science courses. Um, so it would be really interesting just to. to I'm going to first open it up to the crowd, and I'm sure I have some, some questions um, because I think we're kind of limited in time. But um, please uh, ask some questions that you might have uh, for Mike. You may have a mic, no pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, absolutely brilliant, and also blown away in trying to wrap my head around uh, quite a few of those pieces. It seems that, just broadly speaking, um, one major challenge with this is a complexity or signal-to-noise ratio. Um, 
challenge. So if a system, given system has 10 parts, then those 10 parts can interact with each other. And each of those 10 are susceptible to interaction by exogenous influences. And then in turn, a cascade, those could interact. So that's just 10 parts. Um, and in the case of a planaria, though you pointed out how complex that actually is genetically, um, there, so if we go from planaria and especially to humans, there's a huge exponential increase in the complexity of the system. And so that's a pretty challenging signal to noise ratio because progressively just by computation, there's going to be more noise. So how do you approach that? Yeah. Um, so, so I'll say, I'll say two things about that. Uh, First, uh, the, the, the basic premise is that humans are way more complex than planaria. So I know this is this probably is going to sound weird, but the reality is, is there, we're not. So, so if you look at how things become complex from single cell organisms to multicellular organisms and then onwards, the major differences are all way early. Once you get to, you know, uh, things like um, things like um, a, a jellyfish and things like this. Most of the most of the heavy lifting has been done there. There are very few completely new tricks that you see in even even in mammals and, and humans. Like all, all of the difficult questions are really at that interface between single cell mining so business, lots of cells cooperating to build something. It might be a, you know an insect, it might be whatever. That's that's where the big question is. Everything after that is incremental advances. Really, right? the, the, the the major I mean, we have to wrap our minds. Is we are not that special. All of the, all of the real, like, seriously, all of the really hard questions show up way before you ever get to anything. Like that. Now, the, but, but nevertheless, your, your point is very well taken in that in any system with so many components, the signal to noise ratio, it, it, it sounds, it sounds almost impossible. How does this work? So this is this is a great question, and, and where this comes up a lot is in robotics. And we deal, we have a lot of robotics colleagues, so we say, okay. How do we possibly uh, make anything that is that, that is anything like this in, in an artifact, in, in a robot? The trick is, and the reason that it hasn't worked yet, I think, this is my opinion, is that robots are made of dumb, dumb parts. parts. So you have a robot that hopefully does something intelligent, but every piece of it is not. So, so the, the nuts and bolts and wires and chips and everything else that's in there on its own is absolutely not. That is not how biology works. Biology has competency at every level. And, and this is, you know, I can send you a, a paper where I go through this. Exhaustive detail, but the, the trick is that every every part of this at every level has its own goal directed behavior. So the reason why it's important is if you take um, if if you if you make a, a change in uh, you know we do something like like we implant a, you know we implant a, a piece of an eye into the into the tail of a, of a cat hole. All of our technology is uh, very sort of monolayer, so that you would implant it and there it would stay, and that would be it. Well, what happens in vivo is all of the cells around are trying to make sense of this new new uh, arrangement, and they try to they they, they in, in trying to um, you know they have all kinds of local like tissue level goals are preserve the continuity of an epithelium, so they will immediately peel up and try to make it you know, and then the nerves so, so we have to connect to something to figure out what to connect to the base to connect to the spine. And so all of these different things, because they're all trying to implement uh, uh, local um, set points, local goals, in the end. Yes, and so what this means, this is, first of all, this is a massive, because the question you asked could really be put on its head and say, how can anything evolve at all? And this is something that Darwin was well aware of, because if the slightest change in such a complicated thing is likely to slow up everything. How would this possibly ever work? The reason it works is because every time you make a change, all the other stuff tries to make up for it. If it's a good change, right? If it's a bad change, We've got all of the other uh, uh, systems that are still going to try to do what they need to do despite changing circumstances. This, this business where the frog face or the cut limb or whatever tries to get back to the correct outcome from different starting positions is the key to all of this. It means that these mutations, it, it, it flattens the, the, the selection landscape, right, which otherwise would be super rugged. It means that that it's really much more forgiving to stuff like this. And so what that means, you know, in, in, our, first, in our first work on um, tail regeneration, we cut off the tail, and then we put in a particular ion pump that happened to be from, from yeast. And, and at first you might say, you're never going to get the correct voltage which are flowing in. We, we, we couldn't even, well, like, we didn't have the ability to, to regulate it, to turn it up or down. No, well, how, you, 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 there's no way you can get it. But, but, but the point is, the other cells have a, have a massive ability to make up for our sloppiness because they, they, they evolved to make up for other sloppiness. 
you know, biology is noisy, there's constantly there's bacteria in, on your body making you know, weird chemicals that turn channels on and off. All of this stuff is, is there all the time. So what helps us is the fact that, that a lot of the um, inbuilt systems are hugely tolerant. And this, this is why I think this is going to work. Not because we're so smart, we're going to give them exactly the right uh, signal for signal to noise, system. but because we're going to figure out how to push them just enough so that their native uh, systems are going to be able to make up for whatever they have to do correctly. Any other questions? So that kind of leads to another question. I think it's this is what you might be alluding to. So what is it about the simpler systems, the simpler organisms, that are able to regenerate, whereas for humans, if you sort of transect the spinal cord, you just don't see any regeneration. So what is it about, quote, unquote, more developed or yeah, um, advanced organisms? So, so there's no doubt that, that many of the well no. regenerative animals are, are simpler. Humans have reduced regenerative capacity, but I don't think it's true to say that in general the the so-called lower animals are more regenerative. If you regeneration is sprinkled really sort of randomly across the tree of life. If you look, there are there are types of planaria that don't regenerate anything. There are crabs that regenerate their legs and sister species that don't regenerate their legs. It's sort of all over the place. It's not an issue of complexity. Uh, I don't know what to say about human spinal cords. I, I will tell you a story about the human uh, or the, the mammalian lip, and this is just the story. So it may be right or may be wrong, but this is how we think about it. Imagine that you are an early uh, mammalian ancestor. You're, you're you know, something like a mouse. You're running around the forest. Somebody bites your leg off. Now, what you don't have is 13 months to to sort of uh, swim around and regenerate your leg. You regenerate your leg. You have a you have a rapid heart high blood pressure. You to not be out immediately, to not get infected, and because you're you're a quadruped, you're going to start putting your your weight on that foot. You're not going to regenerate anything. So so the key there then evolutionarily, the better strategy is to scar the thing. Let's just turn on some scarring pathways. Let's scar. Let's see the wound. Let's make sure I don't bleed out, and see if we can you know as we get over from whatever's happening. Regeneration in that case, if you're, you're in dry air, so all those nice injury currents that are going to um, drive regeneration are not going to flow anyway. For, for that. I, I don't know how this maps onto spinal cord stuff, okay? But, but um, I think it is it is interesting that the one example of massive mammalian regeneration antlers is in a non-load bearing appendage. They're carrying this thing up there. They don't need to put their weight on it. It's no problem. They got all you know months to have it grow back. So I think what's happened in mammals is simply uh, ecologically it's uh, a shift towards scarring from regeneration. And I think that what we need to do uh, strategically is to provide the cells with an aqueous, almost amniotic-like environment where they're going to go back to this original kind of, uh, you know, most of the good regenerators are aquatic, and I think that's why. And so, so we've, we've even noticed that, you know, when we put in these biodomes, um, even without the drug payload, just, the virtue, just by virtue of having a protected aqueous environment, that's already a, that's already a better thing. Because the cells are already saying, wait a minute, maybe we can read. This is a different environment. Maybe we, maybe the scarring isn't the way to go here. So, right. so I think I, that, that's a story I would tell about the limb. I, I don't know what's up with the spinal cord. That's fair. Sure. Sure. Um, we need one more comment, then we yeah. need to wrap it up. One more, I, and so I have one more question if no one else has a question. So I, I, maybe of interest to this crowd, you know, I, because this is an integrative medicine uh, seminar, um, is this this notion of uh, the mind being sort of the center of information processing? So the brain, the nerves, etc. Um, so this uh, in integrated medicine, the mind-body connection is very important. So how does these bioelectrical signals that are somatic, theoretically non-neural, um, communicate with a nervous system that itself has its own inf information processing system? Have you learned anything that may be of use for this crowd? Yeah. Um, well, I'd say two things. Uh, I think the more specific thing is that uh, ab absolutely these things uh, do uh, interface with the nervous system. So we found lots of examples where non-neural bioelectrics talks to uh, the peripheral and the central nervous system. They, they absolutely do communicate. They communicate electrically. They communicate via neurotransmitters, via other small molecules. Um, all, all of this is, is, is definitely integrated. I think, I think the bigger point that I would make on this is that so, so, so centrally, the mind-body connection is, is critical. And what I would uh, urge us to do is to think about, expand what we think of uh, when we say the mind. Okay? All, everything that we've been seeing, both, both in our work, just thinking back to the evolutionary origin of excitable neural cells and all of that, suggests that 
there are there are multiple minds in the body. There are multiple information processing systems integrated that are actively trying to achieve specific things. They exist at different scales. There are ones that are subcellular. We like the one that's verbal, so we, that we can we can talk to. But there are there are numerous others, and uh, they all work most of the time together. There are actually uh, lots of uh, competing things that go on when these things are competing. And understanding these dynamics, I think, is going to be really critical for biomedicine. But um, to, to me, when we say when we say mind body, it, it's very important not to be thinking that this is this is the only mind that we need to be thinking about. There are lots of other decision making uh, systems that are that are all sort of um, in the same in the same. Um, can I follow up on that? Please. Again, that was mind blowing. Thank you. Um, but just to follow up on this sort of higher level process, you, you used the word um, pattern homeostasis in some kind of uh, morphological or anatomical sense. And I'm wondering whether maybe it's just a metaphor, or maybe there's uh, another parallel at the level of health. We have these um, homeostatic patterns. Um, that might not just be morphological, that might have electrical signals or other forms of information. And it seems like some of the integrative approaches, the mind-body approaches, energy medicine, is not targeting a physical structure or an organ, um, but it's targeting the dynamics of this emergent field. Um, and that that health of that field then feeds back on the health of the body. I'm wondering if there's some parallels there that um, you've been thinking about. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, actually, uh, lots of uh, a number of people have have thought about these things from from this perspective. So, so if you think about for, forget the bioelectrics for a minute, but if you think about any kind of a complex set of circuits, let's say physiological, you know, whatever, uh, those dynamics are going to have attractors in their state space. And so, uh, you know, people like Stuart Kaufman think about it in the in the in the gene regulatory state space, but there are other people like Dennis Noble and so on who think about it for physiology. Uh, it is it is inevitable that any such system will have will have these attractors, and the and the uh, important thing is that you can you can knock the system from one attractor into another without necessarily rewiring the thing. Meaning by experiences, by events that happen to it, those may be inter medical interventions, or they may be um, injuries, or they may be drugs, or they, you know whatever it is. And so it really becomes very important to understand how, wh which of these attractors are deep and stable, which are not, and what interventions you might need to knock the system from one into the other. And I think that's a general mathematical paradigm that's been used very successfully for a number of fields, physiology being one of them. So I think, I think, I think that's a perfectly reasonable you know, uh, way to think about things. Well, um, as, as I anticipated, this was mind-blowing, and what a great way to start 2020 with uh, the sort of biology and, and medicine of the future. So please join me in, in thanking uh, Dr. Levin one more time. A um, couple quick announcements. Um, as you know, the uh, Osher Center um, offers pilot grants to the community. Um, the letters of intent are due on the 15th of this month. So if you're planning on submitting a grant, we're really looking forward to receiving it. Um, and there's information on our website towards that end. And then um, we're gonna continue with our monthly seminars. Next month will actually be another research seminar, and it's gonna be um, on self-regulation, um, but at a very different, coming at it from a very different perspective. Um, Dr. Uh, Zev Schulman Olivier, who's uh, from Cambridge Health Alliance, and he directs the Center for Mindfulness and Compassion, is gonna be presenting on mindfulness and behavior change, enhancing self-regulation and chronic illness, uh, self-management and primary care. So I hope you guys can join us then. And then those of you who can, please stick around. We have some coffee and tea and some refreshments outside, an opportunity for you guys to network with each other. And um, if Dr. Levin's willing to stick around for a few minutes, um, maybe to ask him some other questions. So thanks again. Happy New Year. and. Uh, that was fantastic. <laughs>